Before we get into this episode, I have to apologize ahead of time. My mic did not work. So you can't hear me very well, but the great news is you can hear Dr. Gray beautifully, and he is the one that you really want to hear today. His work and research is incredible. So with that, let's jump right in and let me introduce you to Dr. Peter Gray, author of Free to Learn. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. We are very excited to have the incredible Dr. Peter Gray with us. Let me introduce Dr. Gray to you. He is somebody that you are going to want to know. You're going to want to see all of his all of his work. You're going to want to look it up. You're going to want to listen to all of his TED Talks because he will change the way you see learning altogether. Um, Dr. Peter Gray is a research professor at Boston College, as well as an evolutionary psychologist with a special interest on child development. He is the author of Free to Learn and Psychology, which is a textbook now in its eighth edition. He has conducted and published research in developmental psychology, anthropology, and education. He did his undergraduate study at Columbia University and earned his PhD in biological sciences at Rockefeller University. His current research and writing primary uh, focus primarily on children's natural ways of learning and the lifelong value of play. He's a founding member of the nonprofit Alliance for Self-Directed Education and a founding board member of the nonprofit Let Grow. His own play includes not only his research and writing, but also long distance biking, uh, bicycling, kayaking, backwoods skiing, and vegetable gardening. So Dr. Gray, thank you so much for coming on today. We are so, I'm so excited to have you. I can't even tell you, like I've been all day, I've been so ecstatic. So my kids even know, <laughs> like, Dr. Gray, So thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, thank you. So first of all, okay, so what, what made you decide, because you are a big advocate of, child-led learning. And so let's start at the beginning. How did that all start? Well, it started many, many years ago. Um, my own son, um, when uh, was going to the public school, a, a fine public school by most people's judgment, uh, was uh, very unhappy in public school, rebelling all the way from kindergarten through fourth grade. Um, his mother and I were constantly being called in to talk with the teachers about what are we going to do with this child who was <laughs> so unhappy and rebellious and making such a nuisance of himself in the classroom uh, because he uh, he thought it was a waste of his time. He thought that um, he was being treated in a way that um, was not respectful. That was the way he felt. Uh, and, um, and it finally kind of culminated, and as I say in, at the beginning of my book, Free to Learn, it culminated in a scene in the principal's office where uh, the principal, the assistant principal, a psychologist, the school psychologist, a psych another psychologist had been brought in special, his classroom teacher, at least one or other two adults, and uh, his mother and I we're all there to confront him. He was nine years old to confront him with uh, the message, the unified message he had to do what he was told to do in school. He had no choice about it. And he uh, looked at all of us big adults. And um, after we said our piece and he said, go to hell. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You know, nine years old, <laughs> nine years old, right. and um, his mother, uh, my late wife, uh, and I looked at each other, uh, and we could see that we were both beginning to cry. We both realized that he was right, that um, he, and we realized he has won this battle. <laughs> He's, uh, he doesn't want to be in school, and we have to be on his side instead of against him on this. And so that was when we decided we would take him out of school. We didn't know what we would do. Homeschooling was not as common and well understood then as it is now. Uh, it was much more rare. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we were not in a particularly good situation for homeschooling anyways, but whatever, we didn't really consider that. So we began to look for other schools. And the only school that he felt that he would be comfortable in turned out to be a very radically alternative school called the Sudbury Valley School. It happened to be with, within just a couple of miles of where we lived, which at that time was a reasonable walking distance for a nine-year-old. And, um, and so he uh, ended up enrolling there. But this was such a different school uh, from anything that we in our culture usually consider to be school, mm -hmm. uh, that even though I was happy that he was finally happy, that he was content there, and I, I wasn't particularly worried about his learning. But what I was worried about at that time was, um, wh well, what about, what if he wants to go to college later on? Can he get into a college if he hasn't done typical schooling? I mean, let me tell you how different this school is. It's it's a school that offers, doesn't eat, not only does it not um, require courses, but it doesn't even offer courses. Uh, children who want a course uh, can organize one themselves and usually talk a staff member into leading it. Uh, and it only goes as long as the children want it. There are children there from age four on through high school age. So it's the whole age range that we usually think of as school age range. Um, there, uh, there have been over the course of the history of the school anywhere between about as a low of 50 and a high of about 200 students at any given time. And there's all kinds of opportunities for learning, all kinds of interesting things to do, all kinds of interesting people, mostly other kids. Uh, and, uh, and the rules of the school are uh, made democratically so that every student has a vote in, um, in the school rules. Every student and staff member has one vote. And um, so that's, that's, the, that's the school. And this school now, at this point in our time, is, has been around for 55 years. Uh, so it uh, has a long history. It's got by now many hundreds of graduates. But because of my concern about, well, what will happen if he stays at this school and never goes to high school, let's say, uh, because of that concern, I did a study um, a few years after he enrolled um, of the graduates of the school and that study really changed the changed my career ultimately i had been doing laboratory studies of uh, <laughs> involving the brains of rats and mice and hormones and binding in the brains and so on uh, but i became really interested in the question of um, of self-directed education as i now call it uh, because that what that study showed is the, the graduates of the school were doing very well in the world. They were well employed. They were in, if they were in careers, uh, they were in careers that they enjoyed. Uh, those who wanted to go on to higher education, on to college, didn't seem to have any difficulty going on. <laughs> And so this was all, this sort of flies in the face of what, uh, as a culture, we believe, we kind of believe your child is going to be lost if they don't do typical schooling. And, you know, here were kids and, it's, and they came from a wide variety of backgrounds. They, you know, the, some of them came from middle class homes, some of them came from more working class homes, some there were kids who were there because they, were failing in public school. There were kids who were there like my son because they were rebelling in public school. There are others who were there just because their parents believed in this right from the beginning and they just started their kids there. I couldn't see any personality characteristics that, that uh, distinguished who would succeed and who would not succeed. They just all seemed to seem to succeed. I mean, I can't say that absolutely everybody did. Uh, people have rough spots in their life, but it, people were doing, the graduates as a whole were doing very, very well. And that led me on to kind of the research that I've been doing for decades ever since of uh, why are they doing so well? What is it? What is it about children that leads them to educate themselves when they have the opportunity to do so? And how do we best provide that opportunity so that they can use their natural ways of learning to educate themselves? So what have you found? Because I, I know you, you've mentioned this before in, in one of the, 
the, the TED talks that I've listened to that you've given that we say, follow your passions. You know, we hear that at every single graduation ceremony is follow your passions. But what's the problem with that in the public school that you found or in the in, well, in any private school, public <laughs> school, charter school system that you found? Yeah, you know, I mean, as you say, it's a very common statement in a, in a graduation speech, whether it's graduation from high school or from college to say, follow your passions. But, you know, if all you've been doing is what uh, adults are telling you to do, <laughs> if all you've been doing is school and schoolwork and adult directed activities outside of school and you've been kept so busy with that that you've never really had time to play, to explore, to daydream, <laughs> to discover who you are, what you like to do as opposed to what other people want you to do. Uh, if you've never had kind of time to um, to try things out, to sometimes fail and then struggle to do better, but doing it on your own. If you've never had time to do those things, how do you even know what a passion is, let alone to really develop a passion? I mean, passion a, a passion is something that you are interested in. That by definition, is something you're passionately interested in, right? And so how, you know, you need that, you need time to discover that. You need time to dabble at this and that and then find out what you really like to do. So when children have free time, when children have a lot of free time, they, 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 they do various things and they get involved in various activities and they play in various ways. And in the process, children discover what they really like to do. For some children, it becomes a, a very, uh, very strong, passionate interest. And they're the ones who really kind of specialize in a certain sense very early. And what I found is a, a roughly 50% of the graduates of a school like the one I studied, and similarly, roughly 50%. I've also done studies of grown unschoolers, people who were homeschooled by the method called unschooling, where they are in charge of their own learning through homeschooling. Um, I found the same thing with, with uh, grown unschoolers, that about 50% of them, it's very clear that they are have a career that is a direct follow-up of a passionate interest that they developed in play while they were children. They became interested in this. They, they had lots of time to engage themselves in it. They became good at it. And then at some point, they figured a way, I can make a living doing this and, um, or something very similar to it and went on to do that. Others uh, may be well employed. And, and not, I, I have to say that I think it's a little bit of a personality characteristic. Some people are a little bit more generalist. They don't, you know, they don't focus on a single passion. We don't, we shouldn't expect that of everybody. And I don't think we would want a world where everybody is that kind of focus. We want people, we want some people who have, you know, who are, who are uh, sort of have, uh, F sort of have a somewhat more free-floating attitude towards life, but they, um, they, uh, what I found is whether or not they had that kind of a very, f very focused passage, uh, uh, passion, that they were, that the graduates were generally well employed, they were supporting themselves, they were happy with their lives, um, they did not regret having had the kind of um, self-directed education that they grew up with. That's fascinating. It's fascinating, which I, I think it's you also because I've, I've heard you talk it too about children who grow up with a, a self-directed -direct, education tend to not distinguish play from work and, and they see themselves already doing doing that thing. Uh, my my 11 year old is very passionate about his animation and YouTube channel that he started a few weeks ago. And I said, Jacob, what do you um, what do you do, want to do when you grow up? And he's like, Mom, I'm already a professional YouTuber. Like, I'm already a professional <laughs> animator. Like, so I'm already doing. It. And I, I thought when you when you had said that, and then and then my son said that, I went, Oh my gosh, that's that's true. So can you talk to that a little bit about what how we see education and how education in children really is? 
and what it really looks yeah, like. It, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point. Well, I think that one of the one of the things I've observed with children is self-directed. There's less of a transition between when you're a child learning and when you're an adult <laughs> taking care of yourself, because you're kind of taking care of yourself all the time growing up. And um, you know, this distinction between work and play, it's an interesting, it's kind of a, in our culture, uh, and I think partly because of the way we do school, this is regarded as kind of a sharp distinction. You know, work is what you have to do. <laughs> play is if you've got some free time, you know, this is what you're allowed to do, <laughs> you know, but it's, and even in school, you know, we lose the, use this language. Um, you have to do your work before you could go out to recess and play uh, as we make this sharp distinction, work and play are, learning and play are two entirely different things. And learning is clearly in the category of work when you're, we're in school, we even call it work, right? And then you do homework when you take school work home. Well, kids growing up with self-directed education, that that language doesn't apply. They're They're following what they're interested in doing and they're learning as they do things that are interesting to them. They're learning to read because they want to learn to read. It's not work to learn to read. They're learning to read because this is what they're interested in, you know, and they want to know how to read so they can pursue whatever it is they want to read about. Similarly with everything else, when they're learning numbers and, and how to manipulate numbers and use numbers, they're learning it for some purpose because they want to learn it. It's not like this is a separate part of life and it's not like, you know, every, when children are playing, of course, some of it is hard. I mean, see, play is often hard, it's, uh, but it's self-chosen. It's something that children are tr doing themselves and they want to do it well and they're interested in doing it well. So they immerse themselves often very seriously in the activity that they're involved in. So, so that distinction between where I also discovered um, some years ago, I, a graduate student of mine and I did a survey of anthropologists who had lived in hunter-gatherer cultures in various parts of the world and uh, where children grow up uh, much the way I just described at this school that I described where they, they're not, they have a lot of free time, they're playing, exploring, largely in age mixed groups, largely away from adults. But they have access to the adults and they can see what adults are doing and they play at the kinds of things that they see often that they see are important to their culture and they grow up this way. But one of the things that I learned is that the, the most of these groups don't have a, even a word for work, meaning work as we define work. They don't have a word for that. They don't distinguish between there's not a category of activity that they call work and a different category of activity that they call leisure or play or whatever, because they, you know, they all want to do the things that they have to do because they, 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 um, well, I, I've actually written on various reasons why for them, what we would call work is play, but it's partly because it's by choice mm -hmm. that um, you're not required to go out and hunt or gather. Um, everything is shared and only those people who want to do it on a given day do it. So that's part, that's part of it. But also it's done socially and also these are activities that are fun. They're kind of like the activities that we would do if we're out vacationing, <laughs> you know, in our culture. So they, they don't have this distinction. This is a kind of an artificial distinction between work and play. There was a one of the famous play researchers, Brian Sutton Smith, who died a few years ago, used to say the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. And I think there's some truth to that, that you take away play from people and they become depressed. And I, I've written about why I think that we have such a high rate of depression and suicide even among school-aged children today is uh, because we have so deprived them of play. We're, we're putting them in uh, non-playful, work-like, adult-directed activities. Most of the time, we're not allowing them the freedom that I had back in the 1950s when I was a kid to just go out and play with other kids. Uh, and I think that, I think that's causing a lot of uh, the distress that we're seeing today among, um, among children and especially among teens. Wow. 
So it's interesting. One of the moms that I met with yesterday, who's been toying with the idea of, of pulling her kids from the, the, the school system, said that her, her 12 year old has been diagnosed with ADHD and is a problem in the classroom, but yet there's almost zero recess. And, and I think, do you feel like, uh, particularly with our boys, that there's some amount of misdiagnosis with ADHD when they are naturally inclined to be moving and doing? What, what are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, a absolutely. I mean, what we are, um, we are, we are, in some sense, calling normal child behavior a disorder, um, and especially maybe normal boy behavior. I mean, boys get this diagnosis much more than well, something like four or five times the rate that girls do. Uh, and I think really what it is is that boys tend to be more impulsive than girls, <laughs> and basically this is uh, this is impulsiveness. You are, you know, you're you're being required in school increasingly today uh, compared to decades past uh, to spend lots of time sitting in your seat <laughs> doing what you're told to do. And um, this is not good for anybody, in my opinion. It's not good for girls or for boys, but girls tend to tolerate it better than boys do on average. Uh, so I do think there's a sex difference there. But uh, I did a study, it, it, this was not a formal study, I have to say, it was an informal study. So it, I never submitted it for publication in the journal, but I wrote about it on the blog that I do for Psychology Today where basically what I did is I surveyed um, uh, people who uh, had a child who was diagnosed with ADHD while in school and then took their child out of school for homeschooling or in a few cases to go to a, a, a democratic school like the Sudbury Valley School. Most of them had taken their child out for homeschooling. And what I asked in that survey is what happened to the ADHD when you took the child out? Did it continue to be a problem? Uh, what happened with their learning? And what I found was that in almost all cases, the parents said, we could take him off of Ritalin or whatever the drug was we were using. He was okay. You know, he was still a very active kid, but now it wasn't a problem <laughs> you know he, could, he doesn't have he doesn't have to sit in his seat all the time he can jump on the couch if he's a little kid he can do whatever <laughs> whatever kids do and it didn't seem to be a problem with their learning and um none of them you know essentially none of them seemed to think this was a learning problem they could learn perfectly well uh my son, who is the one who got me interested in all of this, is still a staff member at the Sudbury Valley School. And I asked him at one point, what happens to kids who come to the school, this school, who are diagnosed with ADHD? And he said, well, uh, first of all, we don't even, we don't, we don't in any official way know who has that diagnosis because we refuse to look at any of that. We just look at the kid for who they are. But then, um, but I do know because they talk about it, who <laughs> many of the kids who, who had that diagnosis. And here's what I find. At first, they get in trouble with the judicial committee. They break a lot of rules, you know, there. But they come around when their own peers are telling them, hey, wait a minute, you, you can't be shouting in the quiet room. <laughs> and their own peers are telling them, you know, that, that what's appropriate or not appropriate. They can control themselves when it comes around. They're they're more impulsive than the typical kid, but they're within the range. They're all, all within the range of what I would call normal. And so, and and when I asked him, well, what about learning? And he said, when they're when the difference is that when they are doing what they want to do. They don't have any difficulty paying attention and focusing. <laughs> they, if anything, he thinks it's a care that that they hyper focus. That maybe part of the problem in school is that they're not willing to have their thoughts disrupted by what's going on in school because they really want to focus on the things that they are interested in rather than what somebody else is trying to impose on them. So when it's self-directed education, it does not seem to be a problem. Now, I don't want to say that there may be some cases. I think they're very rare. 
some cases where somebody really by virtue of how their brain is built or whatever are really so uh, impulsive that it really disrupts aspects of their life and for them there may be um, may be cause for them to be taking these powerful psychoactive drugs but the fact that we've got something like 20 percent of boys get this diagnosis and at some point in their schooling career and are put on these drugs and we even today we don't know what the long-term effects of these drugs are uh so i think that that i think that's atrocious that's a you know we should we as a society we should be ashamed of ourselves that we are diagnosing something like we're, we're telling something like 20 percent of boys that you have a you have such a serious disorder that we have to put you on this powerful drug so that you can basically adapt to school because that's what the purpose of the drug is well i, I think it's interesting too because i i i ask myself like what psychological effects does it have on these kids when we tell them again and again and again, there is something wrong with you because you can't sit here right. and be quiet for eight hours a day. Like the long-term psychological effects on these kids, boys or girls, um, like, have you done any research to find out like, how does that affect their self-esteem in the future? Yeah, no, I, I have not done research on that. And it's been a while since I've sort of reviewed the research. I've been, been maybe five or six years, so there may be new research done. I do know that there's some concern, and there are animal experiments with uh, drugs that show that um, that they, like so many drugs, they kind of create some dependency. So if you are um, if you're on these, so normally kids as they grow, they outgrow some of that childhood. Um, impulsiveness. We become as part of the maturation process, we become a little bit more controlled, a little bit less impulsive. That's part of the difference between being a young child and an older child and ultimately an adult as we get a little bit more, some of that forebrain takes over some of the lower parts of the brain and we begin. But there's animal experiments that suggest that this developmental process gets um, gets inhibited by the drugs that um and and therefore you become kind of dependent on the drugs so we have more and more adults who continue to take uh the the drugs even when they're past school age um because they feel um they're impulsive uh as adults so you know again i don't know the details of the research i don't know the detail i do know that that different children have different reactions to the drugs. I've talked with kids who've been on the drugs. I've talked to parents who've put, one of the effects of the drugs, interestingly, is to reduce playfulness, to reduce mm -hmm. your desire to play. That may be kind of how it has its effect in a way. Um, and I've talked to, yeah, I've, I, I've known a couple of kids who were on the drugs and I've talked to a few parents whose uh, kids were on the drugs and they said, you know, the person's personality changes in a way that is not positive in my mind. The person that this was a very playful, fun person to be with who is less so when on these drugs. It, it's interesting that there are actually studies done where animal research done where you try to you raise you raise this most most of this work is with rats you raise young rats in a way that they have exposure to other young rats but don't play with those other young rats and the way you do this is the rats that they are exposed to are treated with a drug that knocks out their playfulness it doesn't knock out other behaviors so in the experimental group, they have access to these young rats who are not playful because they've been drugged in a way that knocks out their playfulness. And the other group has access to rats that are still playful. And then the ones who have access to rats that are still playful grow up much healthier psychologically. They're, they're, they have better social skills. They're less fearful. They're more in control of themselves than the rats that didn't have the opportunity to play. Now, the interesting thing is, what is the drug they use to knock out playfulness? It's exactly the same drug that we give to kids <laughs> to treat ADHD. In yeah. rats, it, it inhibits play. 
Wow. Well, and I, I, so I have one child that, that are his psychologist and his therapist said was the, and the pediatrician actually as well said was the poster child for ADHD. He's now an adult, but for a couple of years, we put him on, on, we had him on Ritalin and then uh, switched to another, you know, a couple other medications. Right. And he'd always say, mom, I feel like I'm in slow motion. I feel like I'm walking molasses. I don't feel as happy. I feel sick to my stomach. Right. And we ultimately ended up just after a couple of years, taking him off of it and, and got him into football. And he started playing more and more and more. And he, then he'd go out and play in our cul-de-sac and the harder that he played, the more he felt himself. Right. But also I noticed that he had, it would calm him down just being able to, to, to play right. and to, and to play hard, which leads me to the next question because your, your specialty is play. Let's talk about that a little bit, because one of the things that you, I heard first heard you discuss in a Ted talk, I think it was a Ted talk. I can't remember if it was your book or the Ted talk where you discuss, um, uh, organized sports versus free play. And right. I ended up taking my kids out of soccer. None of them liked soccer, but I felt this need that they have to, everyone does soccer. So they have to do soccer because they, you know, but I took right. them out of soccer as a result of what you said. So let's talk about, if you could talk about play a little bit as it relates to organized sports and what's, what's, what's shifted over the last few decades with play. Right. So first of all, I should probably define play. So play, uh, briefly defined, is an activity that uh, has the following four characteristics. And the first characteristic is that it's self-chosen and self-directed. So that's the difference. That's the primary difference between a free play pickup game of soccer versus an organized adult directed game of soccer. So self is self-chosen and self-directed. Uh, the one of the major purposes of play evolutionarily is that it is the vehicle through which children learn how to take initiative, learn how to create their own activities, learn how to direct their own activities. Very important kind of general skill for all of life. Second characteristic of play is that it's intrinsically motivated. It's something that you're doing for its own sake. It's do it, you're doing it because you want to do it, not because of any reward you're getting, any extrinsic reward you're getting. You're not doing it for an A on a report card or for a trophy or for your parents' approval or to improve your resume. You're just doing it because you want to do it. That's the aspect of play that leads you to discover your passions, right? I mean, we talked about that just a few minutes ago. This is, uh, you're doing what you want to do. You're discovering what your passions are and you're doing that and you're becoming good at it. Uh, the third characteristic of play is that, so people sometimes talk about unstructured play, but the third characteristic of play is it's always structured. Play is never an unstructured activity. It's always structured, but it's structured by the players themselves. It's structured, it always has, you're always playing at something, and that something involves structure. You're, you are you are, there's some boundaries to what you're doing. You're building a sandcastle. You're not just randomly piling up sand. You've got in your head an um, idea of a sandcastle. You're doing that. Or you're having a play fight and it's a play fight and there's certain kinds of movements in the play fight that are allowed and not allowed. There are rules to what you're doing. One of the I, arguments about why ADHD is so common, I think it's partly so common because it's overdiagnosed, as I just said, but there are some people who have argued, and I think there's legitimacy to this argument. One of the reasons that there, that impulsiveness is so high is because children aren't playing enough. That you, it, play is how you learn how to control your impulses because you have to control your impulses <laughs> when you're playing. Your your playmates will remind you, well, wait a minute, you're breaking the rules or, you know, this is what you, we have to do to play. You can't, you're the pet dog in our game of whatever it is we're playing. You've got to walk around on all fours. You can't get up and start talking English. So that's the, so you're learning, you're practicing rules. You're learning how to make rules. You're learning how to follow rules. Play is structured. And then the fourth characteristic of play is even though play has rules and it's structured, there's always a lot of room for creativity in it. 
So play is how children practice creativity, is how they exercise the creative aspects of their mind. And there's, especially for young children's play, there's a lot of imagination in it. They're exercising their creativity and their imagination. So play, you can just see by the definition of play, by those four defining characteristics, the benefits of play to children. So how does, like, so let's translate that, because I think a lot of times as parents, we think, well, they're getting plenty of playtime because I, they're in hockey, or they're right. in, you know, they're in soccer, and so they're playing, and it's a game. What is the problem with that ideology, so, or right. the way that we think of play in that regard? So. So I've just I've just described everything that children learn when they are playing, when they're right, playing right. the way I define playing, right? When it, some people would call this free play, but to me it's not play if it isn't free. So I call it play, but for, perhaps for clarity, we should call it free play versus adult structured activities. So the way I, one way that I talk about this, because I played a lot of baseball uh, as a child, uh, you know, we'd go out to the vacant lot and whoever was there, we'd get up a game of baseball. That was the way, this was, this was across America at that time when baseball really was the American sport, right? <laughs> the, uh, and, and so I played a lot of baseball and in high school, I played formal baseball. I played on the high school team. So I've had, I had experience growing up just playing baseball as where it's really play and quote playing baseball where it's a varsity sport uh, and the difference is that when you're playing baseball as a varsity sport it's a good place to learn baseball right yeah. but you're not learning all these other lessons that are so much more important for all of life for 99.9% .9 of people the, the people who aren't going to go on to become professional baseball players <laughs> than, uh, than knowing how to play baseball. <laughs> so think of the, here, let me describe a typical game. So we'd go out, you know, this was from beginning when I was seven years old on through when I was about 13 or so. You would go out to, uh, to the vacant lot and there'd be a bunch of other kids showing up in the vacant lot. This was back in the days when moms everywhere said, get out of the house. I don't want you in the house. <laughs> so you get out of the house and go out to the vacant lot. So there's a bunch of kids there and uh, there's no adults there. And, um, and there's big kids, there's little kids, there's good baseball players, there's complete novices. There's, uh, there's no manicured baseball field. It's just a vacant lot. And um, there's a, there's a busy street off in one direction. There's maybe a house with windows off in the other, another direction. So think of all the things you have to do in order to play baseball. First of all, you've got to choose up teams. You don't have 18 kids there, so you're going to have to you're going to have to be creative and figuring out maybe one person will catch for both sides. Maybe we can have two outfielders instead of three. We can do all this. You don't have an umpire to call balls and strikes. You have no coach telling who's going to play what positions. You've got to negotiate that. Everybody wants to pitch, but we're going to have to rotate the pitching. You're going to have to, you've got little Timmy there who's going to go home if you pitch too hard to him. But you've got big Billy who's going to be disgusted and go home if he pitch too soft to him. <laughs> so you've got to take all of this into account. You've got to negotiate, compromise, create ground rules. Anybody who hits it out into that busy street, automatic out. Anybody who hits it towards those windows, automatic out. Uh, big Billy has to bat left-handed with a broomstick. You know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but this is the kind of thing that uh, that you decide upon. Think of the learning that's going on there. You are learning how to negotiate, how to compromise, how to argue your case in a constructive way, because if you don't argue it in a constructive way, you aren't going to win the argument. And, you, and maybe most important thing, maybe the most important thing anybody ever learns in life is how to tell if your playmates are having fun or not. Because if they're not having fun, they're going to go home. The, the, the primary freedom in real play is the freedom to quit. Nobody is there by compulsion. Nobody has to be there. <laughs> they're there just because they want to be there. In that 
little league game, adult directed, you can't just decide to go home. You know, nobody will. You know, you'd be you'd be yelled at by everybody. You know, you, but you can in this pickup game, you can just decide to go home. I, I'm not having fun. I'm going home. So you've got to make sure that everybody's having fun. So these are incredibly important lessons. And as soon as we have an adult there doing the stuff for the kids, <laughs> then you take all those lessons away. Why do you think that we have, have because there is definitely a decline in play. In yes, absolutely. Right a huge decline. What do you think has caused that decline? So I think it's a large number of things. So for people who are interested in this, I I, I now have um, a, uh, I'm doing a Substack, a series of, of, of essays on Substack. And one of my relatively recent Substack articles addresses exactly that question. What has happened really since the 1950s uh, to lead to the gradual decline of real play uh, and generally real freedom and independent activities for children and and how children's lives have been increasingly um, taken over by adults and um, and and I think that there's a there's a number of causes and let me just try to enumerate them briefly I think that the decline already began even in the 1950s Howard Chudikoff who wrote a book on the history of play of child childhood in America cites the 19 1955 as the turning point when he talks about the first half of the 20th century is the golden era of children's play when children had a lot of freedom to play i fortunately was a child during the tail end of that golden era in the early 1950s and uh and into the all the way to the 1960s but so so what so he he takes 1955 as the turning point because that was the year uh what that the Mickey Mouse Club came on television. <laughs> so <laughs> television became uh, a, a, an attraction to children. So, and I even remember this. I mean, we used to play, we used to generally, you know, after school, we wouldn't go home. We would play outdoors. We'd just play with, we'd just continue often to play in the school yard or depending on where he lived, we would go fishing or we'd do something, but we didn't go back home. Um, we would we would play until dinner time. And um, but the Mickey Mouse Club was after school. <laughs> and so, you know, I like uh, a lot of uh, 10 year old boys was uh, in love with Annette Funicello, who was one of these <laughs> Mickey Mouse. Club. So I went right home and watch Annette Funicello on Mickey Mouse Club. And so the uh, Television became kind of an attraction and it competed with play to a certain degree. And then once you were home, were you going to then go back outside again? So television was part of it. I don't think that's the major part from today's perspective, but I think that was part of it. The other, the, uh, another thing that happened is that, so in the 1950s and even in the 1960s, adult organized sports were very, very rare. And, um, but people began to get the idea, well, wouldn't it be nice to have adults, instead of kids just going and playing like we were always playing, wouldn't it be nice to have adult have, you know, have a real field for doing this and have a coach there who would teach you how to do it. And this was very attractive to parents and to some degree it was attractive to kids too, if, if you're, especially if you're adding that on to just your free play. So Little League actually began in 1939, but it didn't become very common until the late 1950s and into the 1960s. So Little League Baseball, but then you began to have uh, adult directed leagues of all kinds of sports, football and and um, and ultimately soccer more recently, hockey, peewee hockey and so on and so forth began to uh, become common. And parents tended to push that. I think that although kids were playing and parents were pushing their kids outdoors to play. I don't think anybody at that time particularly valued play. <laughs> so do you feel like, like, um, long term, because we're now seeing, I was a child of the eighties. I remember the milk cartons. What are you finding now, now that it's been decades later, when we've really seen this decline of play, 
keep seeing the, as the long-term problems that we are experiencing. You mentioned suicide. What else? Well, so the um, so so let me just add one uh, uh, another point I wanted to make that happened in the 1980s is that um, is that the uh, there was a book sponsored by the government. It was a government commission that wrote this book that basically was saying that the United States is in danger um, because our school system is failing. And um, basically the tone of the book, the message of the book was we need to start doing in our schools more like the East Asians are doing in their schools. <laughs> we need more drill, we need more time in school, we need standardized testing, we need, we need to be able to measure education and make sure that children are, um, are being well educated by whatever that measure is. So the school system began to change as early in the 19, as the 1980s. It, it, the, the biggest part of the change occurred in the early part of the 21st century uh, mm -hmm. with no child left, well, no child left behind um, and then followed by Common Core. So the school system began to change and that led to ever more time in school, more homework, more pressure on kids to, um, and it took away a lot of the recess and the more creative things that occurred in schools. Gotcha. So schooling changed. And it was also around this time that, pe that parents began to see it as very important for their children to go to college. And many parents, uh, again, I believe this is a myth, but believed that believed in this myth that it's very important for their child to go to a uh, elite college. <laughs> yeah. That if they're going, that, that that there's a big difference between going to an Ivy school, Ivy League school, or one in that caliber versus the state university. There's actually research showing that it doesn't matter in the long run. It's more important to go to whatever college you feel comfortable in, and there's actually some disadvantages in going to the more elite college. And, and uh, but that's for another talk. Uh, but the uh, the um, but at any rate, parents began to believe that. So there was a lot of pressure being put on kids to uh, to develop basically a college resume. And, and and the way I often put it is that we turn childhood into a period of resume building. And, um, you know, that's just not natural childhood where children are feeling pressured to, to develop a, a record that would get them into college. And it's, and it, it's very different thing from finding out who you really are and what you really want. And, you know, many parents make the decision, even while the child is still in the womb, that this child is going to go to college. They're already saving up for the college expenses, right? I mean, as if the child has no choice in it, you know, that uh, we've decided on this already and the child isn't even born yet. But so parents have, have uh, this is a mission almost, and that gets pushed on the kids in a way that, gener that really does generate a kind of... A, anxiety about achievement. Am I doing everything I need to do? And, and children buy into this and they begin to believe that they will be failures in life if they don't succeed on these adult chosen activities, don't do well on the tests, on the get into the honors classes and all of that kind of thing. So that that all had an effect, um, and then that affects what kids are doing after school. That many of kids are being put into tutoring programs as well as adult-directed sports, and increasingly, life is being taken away from them, governed by adults. So, I, I think all of those things happened. Any, so thank you so much for coming on today. Any last thoughts that? that parents need to know, particularly parents leaving the school system with kids and, uh, and teenagers, what would you say? Last so, thoughts. So I think that, I think maybe what parents who are taking their child out of the school system, the hardest part of it is um, overcoming your own fears about it. Uh, the, uh, 
I did a study some years ago, along with Gina Riley, um, who's a professor at Hunter College in New York, of um, in which we surveyed um, families. It was mostly moms who address answered the survey um, who were unschooling parents who not only were they doing homeschooling, but they were doing it by the method of unschooling where the children had um, control of what they were learning and the parents were facilitators and helped the children pursue their interests, but didn't impose a curriculum on them. And um, we asked a lot of questions of them. And one of, the, one of the questions was, well, what do you see as the major challenge? So what's the hardest part of it? And I think we initially thought maybe the hardest part would be having your kids around all the time or yeah. having, uh, having, uh, having to give up, you know, if one parent has to stay home rather than work, having to give up that income that might come from out of home work. But far and away, the two biggest challenges were dealing with other people's questioning of what you're doing and dealing with your own questioning of what you're doing. <laughs> Because we all grew up, at least almost all of us grew up going to school. Our own parents went to school. Probably our grandparents went to school. We can't, it's hard even for us to imagine what it is to grow up without school, as we usually think of school. And, and it's ingrained in the culture that school is really important. And so people have the impression that, well, if you don't go to school, uh, won't that person's life be ruined? And my research and that of others, there's now, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are doing this. It's still a fairly small percentage of the American public, but it's a lot of people doing this and they're doing well, you know. Yeah. And so the truth of the matter is you don't have to do what everybody else is doing. And if your child is not doing well in the public school, I can almost guarantee you your child will do better outside of the public school than in it. So that's, but, but that's the... Um, that's the fear that everybody has, and it's hard to overcome that fear. And I think the most helpful thing in overcoming it is to talk to other people who are who have done it and are doing it. You need to have a kind of a new reference group. We're all sort of creatures of norms. It's very hard to do something that if you think nobody else is doing this, you know, it's uh, right, right. why who, why uh, this seems weird. It seems just strange. Nobody it. To do something that's not normal is to do something that's abnormal, right? And it's right. people's minds. So you want so you need to develop a new set of norms and you need to develop a new a community of people who understand what you're doing, who have done what you're doing, who can tell you, Oh yeah, my child wasn't reading at age six either. <laughs> my child learned to read at age 10 and now my child is a great reader. You know, you need people who can tell you those kinds of things that, to reassure you. You don't have to, that, you know, there's nothing magical about those the, the curriculum that the school system has developed. That's a system that doesn't work for everybody and doesn't work for most people. And most people, people some kids learn to read when they're when they're younger than that. Some kids learn to read when they're older. I have yet to find any child in self-directed education who didn't learn how to read. That, there's never been a child at Sudbury Valley School out of hundreds who've been there who didn't learn how to read, mm -hmm. even though they don't teach reading. <laughs> they all learn how to read. They all learn how to read. If, you're, if, you're, if your household is a literate household, your child will learn how to read. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so your child may or may not ask for help. Your child, some you know, I did a study of learning how to read and some kids, uh, you know, I'm taking reading because that's one of the things people fear about. If their child isn't learn, hasn't learned to read by age six or seven, people get nervous about it. People also get nervous about math. And the question I ask is, you know, what kind of math do you actually need in our culture today? And the kind of math you actually need in our culture today is the kind of math you're going to experience in the culture today anyway. Right, and if, right. you're inter if you're interested in something that requires a different, kind of math and that you're not going to just pick up in the culture, you can easily learn it and, and at any time. And there's so many different ways of learning it. And, and I see children over and over again, they get interested in something that involves math and they figure out the math. They learn how they learn it. They may or may not ask for help. They may just look up a tutoring program on the internet. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of ways of learning this stuff these days. So I think that's the main thing I would say is that expect if you're doing this for the first time 
expect that you're going to worry about it, <laughs> but the um, but overcome that worry by uh, by talking and being in touch with other people who are who have done it and are doing it. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much um, for all you listeners. Dr. Gray's book is free to learn. Um, and I'd like to, I'll include this in the show notes below. So if you want to order his book, as well as um, links to some of some of Dr. Gray's TED Talks and his Substack essays, so you can look into those. Dr. Gray, thank you so, so much for coming and inspiring and continuing to inspire over and over and over again. Every time I hear you, I just, I come away more confident as a mom and I appreciate the confidence that you give us with the research and the data and your own experience. So thank you so, so much. Well, thank you. I'm, uh, it's been a pleasure. So thank you. And with that, mamas, you got this. You're doing better than you think. We'll talk next week. If you enjoyed this today, please like and subscribe. You could also join our private Facebook group at School to Homeschool or sign up for our newsletter at www.schooltohomeschool. Have a great day.